Okay, shall we start? Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Thomas Kazulenas, uh, background in political science and history at the Vilnius University. He has been international visiting fellow in Taiwan and is going to start a new challenging activity at the De Gasperi Foundation in Rome, specialized in media literacy, security and civic education. Thomas is the director of the Civic Resilience Initiative that, is, that has been granted funding and long-term contract by the EU Commission, the Embassy of Lithuania and NATO Public Diplomacy. He has been living in Rome for three years, but we're going to have this seminar in English. And um, Thomas will tell us more about the Civic Resilience Initiative that is a Lithuanian non-profit, non-governmental organization funded in 2018 in Vilnius by a group of experts based all around Europe. So my presence here is just to set the ground of this seminar. And what was critical to me and is still critical to me uh, about Thomas' speech tonight is the topic itself, because media literacy and civic resilience building is new to my understanding. And I was wondering how these two words are related how they stick together. So um, according to the European communication titled Tackling Online Disinformation, a European Approach of April 2018, this information is understood as verifiable false or misleading information that is created, presented and disseminated for economic gain or to intentionally deceive the public and may cause public harm. Public harm comprises threat to democratic political and policy making processes, as well as public goods, such as the protection of EU citizens' health, the environment or security. And there is need to strengthen the collect collective resilience in support of our democratic bearings and European values. And here I can finally understand why we talk about resilience. So resilience is this capacity of restoring trust and democratic values after the shocks caused by disinformation. Um, so the Civic Resilience Initiative focuses its activities on increasing the resilience of Lithuanian, but not only Lithuanian, but also other societies in the spheres of security, media literacy, and uh, disinformation, empowering the civil society. And uh, if we go into this website, we see pictures of people as an army uh, of citizens, of citizens belonging to belonging to NATO's troops. Indeed, the, this initiative claims to be NATO's eastern flank. Correct. Yes. Um, indeed, on the 29th of March 2004, Lithuania, together with Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Romania, Slovakia and Slovenia, became full-fledged members of NATO. And uh, we again read on the action plan against the disinformation from the European Commission that building resilience also includes specialized trainings, public conferences and debates, as well as other forms of common learning for the media. And it also involves empowering all sectors of society and in particular improving citizens' media literacy to understand how to spot and fend off this information. So which kind of citizen empowerment are we talking about? I think uh, we are talking about engaging several population targets in educational processes. But Thomas, I stop here and the ground is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Roberta. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for having me here. It's it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm Thomas Kazulenas, the director of the Civic Resilience Initiative uh, based in Vilnius, uh, Lithuania. But at, at this moment, I'm I'm living and uh, working remotely from Rome in Italy. So first of all, I would like, uh, I, I am grateful to Roberto Reale and the uh, Utopian organization for this opportunity to speak uh, to online uh, 
I really appreciate our co co cooperation uh, with uh, Utopian, our strategic partner, and I hope to continue our cooperation in, in the near future. Uh, so uh, let me start uh, by sharing my screen and, and show you some, some slides related to our today's, today's topic. Okay, I hope so it's it works. Uh, so it's a, it's a challenging opportunity, I would say, because uh, I'm speaking uh, to you directly, uh, but at the same time, without having an eye contact uh, and speaking about extremely extremely important issue. Uh, so this seminar is an idea that was born out uh, conversation between us. Uh, so thank you for making this webinar possible. Uh, moreover, we are talking in the time of COVID the virus, so when the information is flooding, uh, there is a lot of information, and uh, at, the same, at the same time, there is a lack of information. It means diversity of uh, interpreting uh, information. So, and the main idea of this webinar is to talk about the media literacy in broader context of global flooding, of miss uh, this uh, small uh, information that we have witnessed uh, of the last couple of years. Since the coronavirus pandemic erupted, uh, leaders in, in the democratic world, world uh, have responded in various ways, but some states and non-state actors have been trying to take the advantage of the situation and spread not uh, credible information. Uh, so one more goal of this webinar is uh, to share the exceptional experience of uh, my country in countering this information, uh, teach media literacy, and give some tips and tricks how to be more resilient uh, and critical in our mass media environment. Um, so very, very briefly, I would like to present uh, you our organization, uh, Civic Resilience Initiative, uh, which uh, is an educational center focusing uh, especially on security, media literacy, and disinformation. Uh, we identify the educational gap and provide the innovative solutions, delivering the best results in long-term promotion of uh, democratic processes. Uh, the aim of our activities uh, is to increase the resilience in, of societies, encourage people to think critically, become more media literate, to build media literacy and, uh, and the ability to, to operate uh, in an environment full of propaganda messages. Uh, so, in, in order to fight it, uh, we initiate a series, series uh, of practical training trainings every year to introduce to, to young people and journalists, uh, especially from regions. So, as no equivalent uh, is currently available in, in Lithuania, I'm going, uh, I'm hoping uh, that these uh, initiatives uh, would spark. Uh, I think uh, structural changes in our societies, uh, digital resilience field. Uh, I think it's it's critically important uh, to educate a resilient information user on um, how to spot this information yourself, uh, how to avoid uh, being manipulated, uh, how to identify, understand, and uh, read media uh, critically. How to read, uh, how to react uh, to manipulative media and fake news, uh, and how to check the source and the uh, online context. So we will talk uh, about uh, later. And uh, one uh, one more target group uh, we're adapting our activities uh, is military officers 
especially from EFP, NATO troops based in Baltic states. Uh, therefore, we already agreed organizing a couple of trainings uh, for the embassies uh, and journalists uh, in Baltic states uh, about the challenges of uh, contemporary disinformation in order to help uh, develop the critical thinking and to understand the media landscape of the Baltics. So I would like to raise the question, uh, how, how do you think, uh, what is the information? Uh, on the one hand, it's very easy, very easy answer. Information is our environment, uh, actually everything. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is uh, information is also a very complicated question. Uh, because it is facts or is the information fake news can be also an information. Um, so no doubt uh, that uh, something has gone wrong uh, with the flow of information. Maybe we have all become trapped in echo chambers uh, of our own making, uh, wrapping ourselves in uh, an intellectual layer of I know like like minded friends uh, and the web pages and social media feeds uh, echo chambers and the epistemic bubbles are social structures uh, that systematically exclude the sources of information so both uh, ex exaggerate their members confidence in their beliefs uh, but they work in entirely different ways and the epistemic bubble is uh, when you don't hear people from the other side. The echo chamber is what happens when you don't trust people from the other side. So first, you don't want to hear other views, then you can't trust them. So your, your personal information network entraps you just uh, like a cult. Uh, people have different uh, conclusions uh, from the same evidence. So now uh, I would like to show you the first video which explains uh, media literacy as a broad uh, concept. Thomas, just to, to let you know, there is no sound. Should that, is that supposed to, to have any sound? Sorry about this sound. Uh, I will try to solve this problem with the another. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why.
Thank you. Okay, anyway, uh, let's continue. So, oh, maybe, maybe let's try now. Okay. Is yes, better? yes. To, to share the sounds too. Yeah, perfect. Literacy is not only the ability to understand information being presented to us, but also determining the best way to respond to it. When we say media, we are speaking about the way people communicate around the world, whether it is through print, radio and television, the internet or new forms of media. For the past century, mass media has been produced by corporations or state entities that control the content and messages communicated to the public. These organizations edit news, advertising and other information before the public sees the final product. New digital technologies, such as social media, allow for a new freer flow of information. No longer do we rely solely on one source of information, but our information comes from a wide variety of sources. In addition, each and every person has the ability to contribute to the public exchange of knowledge. Of course, the information that we receive may still be biased. So it is important that we understand how messages are created and consumed in all forms of media. This understanding is the definition of media literacy. So, how do we make sense of the diversity of information being presented to us at a faster pace than ever before? We can do so by gathering, analyzing, and reflecting on that information so that we can better understand how and why a specific message is being delivered. We can start by asking questions, such as, who created this message? How is it constructed? What is being left out? What is their goal? Do I agree with what is being said? Is this message targeted to a local, national, or global audience? Who is it intended for? We can also look for information with diverse perspectives in order to produce thoughtful responses. By doing so, individuals are empowered to form their own opinions and are less likely to be swayed by the information they consume on a daily basis. As individuals learn to evaluate information and media resources for themselves, Passive citizens and consumers are transformed into engaged and active participants of the knowledge economy. Okay, let's let's move on. So, luckily, media and information literacy gives us the tools, and we need to and we the tools we need to find the answers. Uh, and I hope uh, today's seminar will be exactly what uh, what uh, we need. So it is obvious that media literacy is a critical need uh, that uh, should be taught in schools, universities, uh, diplomatic corpus, media, and etc. etc. So some countries are, are now taking the initiative uh, to educate uh, children. One of the best example uh, in Finland is Fakta Bari organization which teaches media literacy as a civic uh, competency and uh, fact checking in, in schools from the low ages uh, and as well as I know the UK may, may soon get its uh, own program as well. So it's equally important to develop a resilient information user. The most of the tools, uh, methods, and principles on how to check information are publicly available and easy to use. So, and I, I will show you some, some examples later. Uh, so media literacy is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, uh, create, and act uh, using all forms of communication. Uh, with media literacy skills, uh, you will have the power to think uh, through each of these uh, important questions every time you, you pick up your phone or flip on the radio. So why media literacy is the relevant topic uh, at this moment? Um, misinformation about COVID-19 or, or another topic uh, topics uh, is uh, spreading online like a virus itself, uh, highly contagious and dangerous. Uh, it's uh, confused uh, people about how they should act uh, to protect themselves uh, and their families and plant a necessary panic. Many people, especially those of the older generation, 
thing that most of the things are self-explanatory. According to them, uh, for example, the experience of the Soviet regime and this waving uh, Soviet propaganda form the immunity for our society uh, to disinformation and uh, manipulation as well. So I think it's a positive uh, effect, uh, but there is a danger that uh, excessive uh, self-confidence will lead uh, to a loss of uh, vigilance. Uh, also, the young generation of uh, Lithuania is familiar with the Soviet regime, but their, their experience uh, is different. Their understanding cannot be as deep as uh, the older generations. Uh, technology of uh, persuasion and manipulation develops very quickly. Uh, if public identity and uh, self-awareness uh, is not strong enough, systematic disinformation ca uh, can have a major negative effect. So, and, uh, and now I, I would like to share with you one, one more video, uh, promotional video by journalists, uh, Reporters, reporters without borders initiative, and this video was was created to mark uh, World Press Freedom on 3rd May in launching a fight fake news campaign because uh, combating disinformation is now one of the biggest challenges uh, for journalism defenders. So we can I like the clap. That was quite. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, please. All all good. Yes, yes. I would like to clap because that was really oh. nice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are emotions uh, with all the images. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the campaign's uh, key element was a TV spot entitled, as I mentioned, Fight Fake News. Of this video, it compares the harm of uh, humans caused by counterfeit industrial or products with the political harm resulting from counterfeit news and information. Unlike the traditional type of fakes, uh, those impact on health or the environment is visible and uh, measurable. So fake news undermines the foundations of democracy in a more insidious way. So moreover, uh, survey analysis show that fake news circulate more easily just because of uh, biased cognitive capacities. So our mindset is like this, that we are dominated by fear instincts, uh, drama instincts, uh, as well negative instincts. And uh, these all instincts are very favorable ground for media to approach uh, the readers and their audience. So journalists uh, really feel responsible for what kind of information space they create for all of us. So, uh, as you see, I want to show you my country's experience in tackling this information. Uh, so, yeah, during my, my presentation, I, I would like to share this exceptional experience. Uh, and Lithuania is one of the leading countries in Europe in countering uh, disinformation, fake news and the information operations. And one of the biggest challenges we face today is uh, 
countering online, especially online disinformation, making it all be more important to be able to spot it and uh, not spread it. But this doesn't mean disinformation is always false or untrue. Spreading half truth, uh, mixing facts uh, with fiction, or using content out of context are common practices that aim to confuse the readers. Uh, so in, in April 2020, as part uh, of a multi-phase disinformation operation, false claims were spread that uh, an outbreak of COVID-19 within NATO's multinational battle group in in Lithuania had resulted in NATO's decision to withdraw its troops. Uh, the, fall, the false and misleading news uh, content uh, focused on a fake letter from NATO Secretary Stoltenberg to the Lithuanian Minister of Defense. The letter contained uh, multiple false, hostile narratives related to a rising number of COVID-19 infections among NATO troops and misleading details about Lithuania's public health response to the pandemic. So, despite the clear planning uh, and coordination involved, uh, the campaign failed uh, to gain any significant interest online due to the fast response uh, of the Lithuanian Defense Ministry and close cooperation with NATO to, to debunk uh, this story. Unfortunately, disinformation is still quite active in, in my country. Five years ago, uh, the dramatically increased flow of uh, disinformation on the news portals. That was reason to start to, to fight back. Uh, the elves, uh, they are the gr grassroots uh, movement uh, working uh, undercover to stop somehow or to decrease disinformation. They are elves because uh, uh, they are fighting trolls uh, trying to follow their post uh, to, to, debunk, to debunk it. So it's not uh, an organization, it's like a secret uh, movement. Uh, the unique uh, phenomenon of elves uh, was born in Lithuania in the year uh, 2014 when Russia attacked Ukraine and occupied part of their territory. And for the most part, organized group uh, still working anonymously and show for Russian propaganda machine resilience of, of our society to stand for the free world values. So uh, as, as you see in this slide, it's about uh, 4,000 voluntary elves in total fighting against uh, Russian propaganda. And uh, related to, to this movement, I, I would like to share with you one, one more short video about uh, this uh, elves uh, movement. My name is Richard Sobukinas and I'm a troll hunter. <laughs> Part of the name of our groups are elves because uh, elves are simply fighting trolls. A troll spread lies and the elf uh, spreads uh, trouble. Propaganda is lies. So when you counter propaganda, you need to tell uh, truth. It is the only way. You cannot fight lies with lies. So you cannot fight propaganda with propaganda. I want uh, to have peace here, not war. So when I see that there are propaganda movements uh, which are directed at uh, preparation of war, I need to do something. Five easy steps uh, to spot fake news. 
Uh, when we talk about media, we have to raise a lot of questions uh, before share it. And uh, first one uh, is check your source. Uh, if you come across a story from a source uh, that you have never heard of before, do some digging. Uh, the best thing is browse Google and, uh, and see the options. If it does uh, more information on it uh, and check uh, and compare as well. If it's uh, so viral, check uh, whether there is no another additional source, uh, at least compare uh, two sources. If you cannot find the uh, sources, read as much about the topic as you can uh, to get. And one tip for you, uh, trusted online fact-checking sites like uh, Snopes can help you to verify stories that sound too good to be true. Uh, what to do, the second one is check, check your story. Uh, has anyone else picked uh, up uh, of a story? What do other sources say about it? Uh, do a quick search uh, on the authors of, of your article and raise uh, much more questions. Uh, are, are they credible? Are they real? Are they reputable? Does it have uh, any author with your, your article? So if no, just leave it. If yes, uh, continue. Number three, examine the evidence. Uh, a credible news story, which uh, will include uh, plenty of facts, uh, for example, quotes uh, from experts, uh, survey data and official statistics, uh, for example. If these are missing, uh, question it. Uh, uh, one more tip, uh, you can use tools such as Google reverse image search to check uh, whether an image originated uh, and whether it has been altered. Number four, uh, read and think uh, before share. Only share post uh, you wish uh, you had written. Finally, use your common sense. Uh, bear in mind uh, that fake news is designed to feed uh, your bias, hopes uh, or fears. And number five, uh, just ask uh, the experts. It's it's last but but not least, of course. Uh, so j just ask your ask the experts. Uh, check it uh, on fact checking sites. Uh, I suggest as well reading a lot of uh, long investigative journalism articles. Listen listen or watch uh, interesting podcast as well. And. Uh, the conclusion for me would be that sometimes, or maybe quite often even, for information recipients, uh, information consumers uh, to spot this information or misinformation, you really have uh, read very carefully in order to be able to at least uh, start having some doubts. And that's uh, doable, of course, but at the same time, it's, uh, I think it's unrealistic, unrealistic to expect, uh, to assume that millions of people would have uh, the time to, to do that. So, yeah, uh, here you can see more, more toolkits, more, more tools, methods, uh, and, uh, opportunities to, to check uh, your information. There are a lot of tools and methods how, how you can check your information uh, online, virtually, with using different easy-to-use programs uh, online. And uh, now I, I want to show you one, one more short, short video of how easily check the information in, in using uh, open source intelligence. It's a multi-methods methodology for collecting, uh, analyzing and making decisions uh, about uh, data accessible in publicly available sources to be used uh, in an intelligent context. So have a look.
as you see, it's, it's quite easy to, to check your information uh, in using uh, public, uh, public uh, op open sources. Uh, of course, if you have uh, <laughs> these tools uh, and methods, uh, how, how to check it. So uh, one more slide. Uh, I would like to to show you a couple of uh, couple of examples from from Italy. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, of course, there are a lot of different examples of disinformation or misinformation spreading uh, during the COVID virus period. But uh, but please let me show you and shortly explain two cases from from Italy. So first first example is from Venice, uh, as you see, and it was announced that uh, Venice canals uh, run clear, dolphins appear in Italy's uh, waterways amid coronavirus lockdown. And the video has been shared online, claiming to show not only fish, but also dolphins appearing in Venice canals. But unfortunately, it, it wasn't uh, real. The footage uh, doesn't show dolphins in Venice. Uh, this, this video was actually taken in the port of Cagliari in S Sardinia. Sardinia around 750 kilometers away from, from Venice. So uh, a simple reverse uh, search uh, for key frames in the video found many links referring to Cagliari. So in, in, in my opinion, uh, these fake uh, feel-good stories uh, can make people even more distrustful at a time when everyone already feels uh, vulnerable. So I would encourage people to, to share positive things, but uh, of course it doesn't have to be anything dramatic. Uh, it just has uh, it just has to be true. Uh, one one more example. Uh, it was claimed that Corona has gripped Italy to such as the extent extent uh, that uh, there is no one to even remove corpses. It was translated from, from Hindi language. And uh, no, the, the photo doesn't show dead people at all. Uh, this, this photo was taken uh, on March uh, 24, six years ago in Frankfurt, Germany. So people lay down on a pedestrian area to remember victims uh, who lost their lives uh, their lives in, in a Nazi, con Nazi concentration camp. So the tribute was part of an art project uh, and uh, the investigation agency BOOM debunked uh, the same image in January when it was viral with false claims that it shows dead bodies of those infected with the coronavirus in China. Another thing uh, I would like to say is uh, what are the main disinfo trends uh, on the broader scale of uh, information information warfare. Uh, as you see, there there are the most 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 famous most most uh, popular uh, trends of of disinformation. For example, first one is COVID nineteen is a conspiracy. <coughs> And the, as the infodemic captures the world, old and new conspiracy theories uh, find a way to take over the, the public debate. Um, the another one, COVID-19 spin on dominant Kremlin disinformation narratives, uh, for example, failed state, uh, anti-Western, uh, failed democracy, Russophobia, and etc. and, and etc. Uh, another one uh, trend is that NATO is useless and not to be trusted. Uh, it was claimed, uh, for example, that uh, that NATO brought COVID-19 to, to Lithuania, uh, spread it uh, during exercises. Uh, 
European Union is dysfunctional, divided by self-interest, uh, for example, confiscated mass trope, uh, the West abandoned uh, Italy and, and so on and so on. Western sanctions uh, should be suspended uh, due to COVID-19. So, and uh, the last thing I, I want to show you is, is deep fake uh, technology, how and why it works and what uh, is the risk of, of this uh, technology. Uh, deep fakes are fake videos or audio recordings uh, that look and sound just uh, like the real. Thing and detecting uh, deep fakes in a, is a really hard uh, problem. So have a look uh, to, I guess, one or, or two video. Imagine this for a second. One man with total control of billions of people's stolen data, all their secrets, their lives, their futures. I owe it all to Spectre. Spectre showed me that whoever controls the data. What we've got to do is count on people all around this country to make their voices heard. I'm fighting for Medicare for all. I'm like if Monday Night Raw was hosted by NPR's Terry Gross. I'm fighting for the middle class. I'm fighting for Medicare for all. I'm like if Monday Night Raw was hosted by NPR's Terry Gross. Especially our friends who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. I visited with the families of many of the victims on Thursday, and one thing I told them is that they're not alone. The American people and people all over the world are standing with them, and we always will. And one, one more, I will try. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Jordan Peele created this fake video of President Obama to demonstrate how easy it is to put words in someone else's mouth. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. Not everyone bought it. But the technology behind such frauds is rapidly improving, even as worries increase about their potential for harm. This is your Bloomberg Quick Take on deep fakes. Deep fakes, or realistic looking fake videos and audio, gained popularity as a means of adding famous actresses into porn scenes. Despite bans on major websites, they remain easy to make and find. They're named for the deep learning artificial intelligence algorithms that make them possible. Input real audio or video of a specific person, the more the better, and the software tries to recognize patterns in speech and movement. Introduce a new element like someone else's face or voice, and a deep fake is born. It's actually extremely easy to make one of these things. There were just some supposed, you know, breakthroughs from academic researchers who work with this particular kind of machine learning in the past few weeks, which would drastically reduce the amount of video you need actually to create one of these. Programs like Fake App, the most popular and widely available for making deep fakes, need dozens of hours of human assistance to create a video that looks like this rather than this. In August, researchers at Carnegie Mellon revealed software that accurately rendered not just facial features, but changing weather patterns and flowers in bloom. This advance is not yet available to the public, but with increasing capability comes increasing concern. You know, this is kind of fake news on steroids, potentially. Um, we do not know of a case yet where someone has tried to use this to perpetrate a, a kind of fraud or an information warfare campaign, or, or for that matter, to really damage someone's reputation. But it's the danger that everyone is really afraid of. In a world where fakes are easy to create, authenticity also becomes easier to deny. People caught doing genuinely objectionable things could claim evidence against them is bogus. 
Fake videos can also be difficult to detect. Though researchers around the world and at the U.S. Department of Defense have said they're working on ways to counter them. Deep fakes do, however, have some positive uses. Take Seraproc, a firm that creates digital voices for people who lose theirs from disease. Speech synthesis is the artificial production of human speech. There are also applications that could be considered either good or bad, like the many, many deep fakes that exist solely to turn as many movies as possible into Nicolas Cage movies. Oh, hi, Mark. Okay, that's, uh, I think it's in a nutshell. <laughs> I think uh, what it is so much that I wanted to, to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. I think you gave us a lot of um, insights uh, into this issue. And you also explained us a little bit more about your activities and the motivations who brought you to, to get so committed to this issue. Uh, actually, I'm quite scared uh, after your presentation, but I think <laughs> it was also your goal somehow to make us aware that we have to be concerned about this issue and it, it was also the, the idea of the European Commission since 2015 when these groups uh, for action were created. So I would like to ask you why Lithuania was so much involved, why this Balkan country felt, uh, felt to, uh, so, so much engaged in, in such a fighting against uh, disinformation. Um, we, we have read in, in your publications um, that you, you have been involved uh, because of these hybrid threats. Uh, you also have been threatened and you have maybe also recognized some traits, uh, some common traits with um, your past history uh, in the relationship with Russia, with the um, Soviet Union. So would you like to, to tell us a little bit more about that? But you're muted, please. Unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I started to answer. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for your question, for interested in, in this topic. Uh, it's really important uh, for us to, to share our experience, uh, yeah. know-how and, and so on. So, yeah, my, my country sees itself as, as being on the front line of, uh, of a Russian offensive to, to sow misinformation in the Western world. And the Lithuania civic society, namely non-governmental organizations, uh, are, are directly in, engaged in countering this information and have uh, organized various platforms and initiatives to fight this uh, this uh, issues. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, the uh, ELF uh, movement, uh, you saw a short video about about uh, this uh, movement. Uh, we have m much more initiatives, uh, very, very good, very useful initiatives. And uh, as I mentioned, of course, it's e equally important to develop a resilient information user. People should uh, should be ready and should should use information as a tool to orientate and react properly to situations, but not to be in enslaved uh, by by it. And uh, I think we we must cooperate more, of course, in 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 our country and in in other societies as well, because this is the best tool we have, and uh, yet um, we we often forget or. or refuse to use it. Uh, not all of us are experts, uh, not uh, all of us uh, have resources of time, people and money, especially in, in the regions. And uh, yeah, my country, like other neighbors, uh, shaped uh, by, by Soviet era communism, communist domination, has long pushed uh, for uh, tough approach uh, to disinformation both at home and uh, at the EU level 
And um, I think Vilnius, uh, our capital's strategy is uh, notable for, for the way it, it relies on close uh, cooperation between, between groups in, in society, such as the media and, uh, and the military, which is other respects uh, have a more adversarial um, uh, relationship. And... Uh, as as our foreign foreign minister said that uh, ten years ago there was no way to discuss uh, these issues at all because uh, EU colleagues uh, thought it's you know it's not our business uh, it's it's freedom of speech and and that's it. But uh, it's really critical and interesting because yeah. also families used to 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 consider only one trustable information source and and liked uh, Russian people to rely on that and that's it that was it but now it's uh, it's this turning point of considering the freedom of speech also an asset for the Kremlin's propaganda and yeah. only uh, towards the external <laughs> part yeah. of the world. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it, it took you know it took time to to convince uh, our colleagues in Western that that uh, you know lies and disinformation uh, fake, fake are not freedom of speech. Of course, yeah. Yes, yeah. well, these tools have been always used, you know, in in war, but this is why it's a special word. Maybe this is why you call it hybrid threats because. It's always on the border of being uh, an open conflict or simply misinformation, disinformation, and it's not really acknowledged as a, a weapon, as a real weapon. So thank you very much for, for your effort. I think that propaganda can, can work if, if the, um, the citizens are not uh, strong in their values. So if their resilience is not working, um and but but since you want to to work into education then your mission goes to um, to build solid bases for resilience right okay yeah. i would like to check whether there is any question on the chat i see a green yeah not yet so if anyone would like to to pose any question please please feel free to Yes, there is a question coming. What can be Italy's within the NATO? Especially as far as cyber warfare is concerned. Oh, wow. Can we work together in cyber, in cyber warfare, Italy and Lithuania? Absolutely, no, no doubt, uh, actually. What, what I'm doing now in, in, in Rome, in, in Italy, so I'm trying to, you know, like, like this seminar, I'm trying to, to express, you know, our experience, uh, our know-how, how, how to, uh, how we are working on, on this, uh, hot topic and I'm um, trying to talk with uh, think tanks, uh, think tankers about this uh, very, very useful, important topic, especially for us, but in general for, for other societies as well. And uh, we, we already trying to, to adapt our experience in Italy and uh, have a lot of ideas uh, how, how to do it, uh, how to know how to adapt our educational activities in Italy, for example, it would be really good to organize a, a series of um, seminars, I mean practical seminars for, for journalists. Uh, 
um, in not only in, in you know in Rome but maybe in, in other part of, of Italy so to, to share our experience uh, to get uh, you know them tools methods uh, I, I, I showed you today you know just just some of them of, of it but uh, I think it would be really useful to 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 share the knowledge from our eastern flank <laughs> of of NATO. What uh, how how we say, and yeah, I hope so. In in this period uh, when I'm here, so I I hope so. It it will it will it's it's possible to organize it. Of course, in this challenge challenging period, it's not so so easy to organize it. But maybe on online to organize practical webinars uh, and and so on. So yeah, it would be. I think so. It's it's great any idea. So, which are your main targets now, Thomas? I mean, uh, the, the civic resilience initiatives has got. I mean, maybe you you started with selected targets at the moment. Yeah, um, as I, I sh shortly mentioned, we we have two target groups, uh, and we of course uh, trying to, f to find more more groups. Uh, so one one group is uh, young people from universities, uh, from schools, from 16 till 22, 23 years old. And uh, we, we, we're trying to engage young people in, in practical workshops, uh, in, in more interactive, uh, in a way to the, you know, so solutions, uh, how to educate them, how to, how to show them, uh, you know, attractively and talk uh, about this information. And another ta another target group is um, journalists, uh, especially from regions. Uh, and uh, and uh, one more target group uh, we we are working uh, on is. Um, uh, is uh, officers uh, from NATO troops uh, based in in uh, in Lithuania. Uh, so yeah, it's it's quite a big challenge for us. But uh, but we have a lot of uh, experts from from different uh, uh, topics, and uh, we already. Uh, yeah, we already trying to organize this this part of our activities as well with this target group. Yeah, and one one more target group, as as your colleagues ask, uh, I hope so will be will be you know West, Western uh, societies and and maybe Italy. Why why not? We want to train Italian teachers. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's one, one of the main most important target group as well. Yeah, yeah. So as I mentioned, the Finland example, we adapted this this program to young younger people. I know twenty or fifteen years ago. So and uh, now Finland look is one of the best uh, best top uh, countries in the world um, especially talking about critical thinking uh, about resilience and so on so it's one of the best example for for us how how to work with uh, young people and and especially with teachers as well yeah as, as you mentioned so thank you very much i think we the Ground to, to go ahead and cooperate since democracy is the common ground we're fighting for. I hope so. I hope so. So I, I would like to ask you just just follow us on Facebook, on, on Twitter and uh, you know check out what we are doing and uh, and involve in our in our activities not on not only in, in our language but language but uh, as well in English. So that's great. So thank you very much. Is yes. So thank you for both of us is coming. So I think we are done, and uh, I wish you a good night to all of you. Thank you, Roberta, so much. Together. Okay. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.